thanks everybody for joining us today on the Retail Code. Uh, I have, as usual, myself, Gary Newbury and Lisa Amlani. Lisa, do you want to give us a quick uh, high, le high level? Absolutely. The type of work that I do is really around uh, being a trusted advisor for, uh, with an industry um, insider perspective. So I work with retail tech companies, um, almost like an interpreter, uh, giving them a better understanding of the lay of the land from retail end to end, whether it's merchandising or uh, product creation, um, giving them insight into what retailers actually need from their tech solutions. And then I also help retailers and brands across channel, especially if they are physically native and new to digital, looking at their uh, merchandise assortment, making sure that you know, they're not really taking advantage too much of that endless aisle online. Um, and then, of course, I do uh, some teaching and guest speaking. Excellent. We're going to dig back into that in a minute, but I'll just quickly okay. introduce, introduce myself. I'm Gary Newbury. I'm a senior exec on call, focused on the supply chain, and particularly the retail supply chain, bringing about uh, agility, innovation, and uh, digitization of the supply chain to try to get us all to a much better place. Today, I want to talk about, in your, well, let me put it a different way. In your last Merchant Life newsletter, which is an incredible read, and I recommend everybody has Thank it. Thank you. Uh, I'll send a bill later. Um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> it was all about, okay, so a, a, a retailer will plan out its, its season. It will... Uh, put together its assortment plan or margin markups and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It will bring it, will place orders, bring it into the network, send, send it to stores. Then it knows perhaps it's going to do a markdown program. And at the yeah. end of that, coming to the end of where we think that the season finishes for that particular item or that class, we run a clearance program and then we end up yeah. with stock in our hands. And then you'll know really gave some great ideas of different options that a retailer can avail themselves of. Now, I want to actually scratch a surface on this, not of, okay. of that end of the process, but how do we stop yeah. bringing stock in that's not going to sell? Or if we have to sell it uh, you know, on clearance, why would we create a situation that is very expensive to bring product, yeah. especially if it's coming from the Far East, into our network, spend time and energy putting it yes. into stores, holding it in stores, making people walk past it and not buy it and end up give, effectively giving it away. So yeah. we want to, I think we want to do today in tapping into some of your merchant experience, how can we sure. actually minimize that stock? I think it, it really starts with planning. So like you mentioned, the line plan. So that's really the uh, blueprint of this season, let's call it. Um, and it's where you build the foundation of your assortment. Uh, the way that many traditional retailers are planning uh, with their planning teams and their buyers is that they're planning at, at a minimum a year in advance. When you're planning so far ahead, you don't actually know what's going to happen. Look at COVID. <laughs> That's a great example with store closures. You don't know how many units are going to sell, what categories are categories are going to sell and how many units are going to sell at what colors and really at what price point. So in some cases, it, it has been almost like a guessing game. You're using historical data, um, sell-throughs, that sort of thing. And of course, what's on trend uh, to delight the customers, right? But when you're looking at things a year in advance, it's very difficult to understand what the customer behavior is going to be, the socioeconomic uh, landscape is going to look like, and of course, um, what the customer is really going to want at that time. And that's where, you know, I really push um, that retailers start bringing on a lot more technology to help them make better decisions, whether it's demand planning or um, getting closer to market. Uh, so not buying a year in advance. Well, let me just step back into that. Let's yeah. More, uh, more technology. So let's, let's assume that we've been doing the same process, typically with the same people often yes. uh, for a long time, it's a decade, maybe two. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing when we bring in technology is to automate that process. So in some cases, not yeah, all well, This is what yeah. I want to kind of explore. Uh, if we were just to automate that process, we'd have all the inherent risks documented and embedded into our system to be able to carry on this 
this jolly trip of bringing in stock and ending up having to do markdowns and clearance and, and, and some of those options that you described in your um, number 11 merchant. Yes, yes. Uh, I, so, think, I think what's typical is that markdowns are actually planned into your line plan. I think that's what you're getting at. Well, which, um, yes. Yes. Okay. So as well because, as what, what, Lisa, before you go on, sorry. and also, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, it's okay. <laughs> and also, what would techno, what other areas would technology bridge which humans aren't currently bridging? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. How, how do we break out of this, and how do we use technology to advance our cause rather than just embed our our current situation? Yeah, yeah, and. You know what, we, we can look at this so many ways, but I think when we look at it as the foundation of buying is that land, line plan and the fact that we're planning so far in advance and that we're not using real time data to understand consumer behaviors and what they actually want um, in real time, that is a huge challenge because when you're working with suppliers and factories, they have minimum order quantities. So a lot of what you're doing is, um, you're using these minimum order quantities to place orders of like, let's say 500 units, because that's your minimum. And you know that you're only gonna sell 200 because that's what you sold last year. Then what are you doing with the rest of that 300? You're planning that into your markdown schedule. Um, you're planning that into your promotion calendar so that it matches up to promotional events like a Black Friday or a Boxing Day or a Mother's Day event. That's the challenge is that the way that planners are planning today is so far in advance and they're limited by these uh, minimum order quantities and leadership teams giving them uh, revenue plans and forecasts that, you know, say, okay, you need to increase your uh, revenue and profits by 10%. Uh, then you're going to increase your orders by 10% because that's going to give you that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 10% of extra revenue. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you've, you've heard a lot of stories around markdowns and how people are planning for markdowns, which is not the right way to plan. Yeah. I wonder if, if uh, before we perhaps branch into the supply chain options, you, you, you talk about these minimum order quantities and bear in mind that what you'll probably talk about is a Far East. Yeah. I wonder if they're tied into literally the, the full container, you know, just around the four yes. is worth of and yes. the number for that is 500 or if there's some other factor in the production cycle that it, the setup or you know actually yeah. saying, if i give you five uh, an order of 500 i just bring you into this part of our planning process rather than yeah. let you flounder up towards the end so uh, my, my my question is about i wonder how flexible those minimum order quantities could be made with yeah. a, perhaps a different approach. I think that um, one thing to add before I even get into that is those minimum order quantities are really based on the discounts that you're going to get. So if you order less, you get less of a discount and you're paying more for that product and that eats into your bottom line. So it really all comes down to everything is about profitability, right? Um, we overbuy, we make too much, too much goes into landfills. And now because customers are so much more educated and they see a lot more of how the industry, especially fashion, is impacting the climate and the globe, what you're going to see is that suppliers are going to start catching on because retailers are saying, you know what, I want to be more sustainable. I need to make less. So suppliers, you get on board. We do this together. Markdowns really hurt everyone. So let's just, you know, find a way around that. And I believe that most suppliers are on board. They are a lot more transparent with not only their practices, but how that impacts the number of units they're saying are the minimum order quantities. Um, I find that a lot of retailers are looking at other options like buying local, which, you know, you and I have talked about before. So I think that there is an opportunity here but it really starts with that framework. And if we don't plan better and closer to the customer, to what they actually want to buy, um, we're, we're really going to be stuck in this cycle that we have been in for, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very kind of established formula. 
yeah it's probably f at least from the 70s 80s if not way before that, uh, people in in the merchant sphere are able to let's say currency is is you know the accumulated margin mar initial markup and all these kind of terms are very deeply embedded in 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 that part of retailing yeah i will give one example uh where i wasn't a department store buyer i was a branded buyer with ralph lauren and because we had to buy into programs because they were global and we were representing a brand across many many department stores you had to have a minimum order quantity by region so if within region if germany didn't buy enough then i had to carry that so that we could all buy that style yeah. so i mean again it comes down to that line plan it it comes down to how are we planning uh so far ahead and of course why aren't we working with our suppliers in a better way i've said for some time that uh, retailers have to, especially the larger ones where yeah. they ex exert considerable power on suppliers either you know mm -hmm. it's highway or the highway and there's a there's a there's a cost model you have to fit in if you're going to get mm -hmm. onto my shelf and by the way you're going to have to help me pay for the shelves as well as fees yeah. very complicated <laughs> way beyond. i've said for some time but unless retailers start to look at that dynamic in a different way with all the things that are now available in terms of you know cpgs particularly going yeah. direct you know looking to go direct you know there's um the micro fulfillment center there's cheap property prices mm -hmm. might open you know the cbg like us and they might collaborate with other cbgs yes so that you know in in adjacent areas they may actually say look yeah, let, let's collaborate on this and uh, put a store up you know the craft nestle you know, Conagra store where we yeah. have a range of range of products that we, we can all work to compete, not on against, but compete to win the yeah. customer from that channel called retail, where really it's hard work. Yeah. You know, we, we know we know the scheme. We go in there with our expectation of achieving a rate, they knock us down, then they change the spec halfway through and it costs us even more money. Yeah. But retailers have to find different ways and this 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 pandemic is possibly a way of getting under the skin on this and yeah. actually reflecting on the past and saying what's good of that that we can take forward and what's good of this things like collaboration joint planning that we can actually take forward and make retail the channel that suppliers want to use uh, mm -hmm. but there has to be there has to be some flexibility both ways it can't be the supplier says you know to, to the points that you're making this is a minimum order quantity take it all you know it's just it's just a re reverse of big retailers big suppliers telling you how yeah. how the business is going to work because it's in everybody's interest if we can get a customer yes. in by the staff everybody wins yeah and i think um you know you actually made me remember a great story which was when i was working with caban which was part of club monaco uh, part of ralph lauren uh, Ralph Lauren Home did not work with Club Monaco Caban Home to piggyback on orders to save on transportation costs, um, any sort of um, air sea decisions that had to be made, or even uh, minimum order quantities for the hard goods, which is where a lot of the cost comes from. But with Club Monaco, I was able to piggyback on their orders when they were buying basic t-shirts so that I could bring in 50 units instead of 500 and still get that 80% margin that the Club Monaco was making. Um, you don't see that a lot, especially in hard goods, I find. But a great story from this week is when uh, Valentino's factory actually burned down and Prada said that actually you can use our space to make uh, the shoes. And that's really nice to see where they're not both part of the same umbrella company, like a caring group or a Rishma or whatever. Um, I just love that, you know, product kind of came in and stepped in and said, you know what, you, we can help you. I wish that we could see that across all of retail. Um, yeah. If if sourcing suppliers are not getting on board to lower those minimum. The fact that your order quantity for maybe a season is lower than the minimum order quantity 
-hmm. gives you two choices. Either you find a way of negotiating with the supplier to bring it down somehow, and it may be, you know, using other other avenues you've got access yeah. to, either, either to just collaborate with other suppliers or within the group that you, you may belong to. But then that, that if you can't get that, there's not much you can do in the supply chain because if you say, well, do you know what, just to get it right, we're going to have six months and then six months because we get a closer picture on the market. Yeah, but yeah. You're, but you're faced with two sets of minimum order quantities, so that, that yeah. doesn't take us very far. Uh, but on the situation where you have you have confidence you can sell way above the minimum order quantity, then, it, then it's all about what can the supply chain help us do? Instead of yeah. buying a big bulk and whacking it into the warehouse and feeding it out to the stores, maybe we have two or three attempts of doing this. So we, we reduce our exposure to the stock, but also have the opportunity to fine tune the style, the color, whatever it might be, or mm -hmm. size ring, yeah. And yeah. If, if it's in fashion. And I think that's where technology could really come in and, you know, almost save the day with uh, demand planning tools that uh, if you can get closer to market, you get closer to the customer, you use demand planning to um, understand data and make those data driven decisions that can work with supply chain uh, folks like in a, in a DC, for example, and understand how much workforce you'd need to bring those units through at certain amounts of periods of time uh, within that seasonal calendar. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity there, but we just need to get more retailers on board to use the technology and to accept um, that closer to market is better. Yeah, let me just test that one, closer to market. I wonder, I just want to scratch a surface, what, what, just for the audience, what, sure. what you mean by that? Do you mean making it closer to the market or just being actually closer because we all talk about being <laughs> customer centric of course we all are yeah well, 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 self-evident isn't it no it is not because <laughs> most people so, to, to the point you made I, I think in the last episode where go and shop your brand go on the shop floor yes. go and place an order on on the on the web bump into customers well not literally but you know kind of nosy up to them and, and ask them what's going on what what brought them to the store so being yeah. close to the customer is absolutely essential for retailers as we walk through this because so much has changed yes. and we can't rely on the, the data for the last 10 years to give us any exactly. as to exactly. what's going on now and what they need now so when you say close to the market maybe, maybe you can just yeah sure so what i mean by close to market is let's go back to that line plan again you know line plan takes into consideration the seasonal calendar um, most retailers are planning a year in advance. So when that year starts, that's when they put the concept together. They, they um, develop a line plan, understand how many categories they're gonna buy into, what the depth is, how many colors, they work with designers. By the time they go through the calendar and they get um, to market, it's a year. Uh, if we can shorten that calendar to let's say three, four months, that means you're going to get closer to the time of the goods being on the shop floor where you can uh, predict a little bit better uh, what the customer is going to want. Uh, that's where real time comes into play. It's not really real time because you obviously can't produce in one day. But I mean, 12 months compared to four months, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, if look at COVID, right? Uh, as stores closed in March, a lot, there was a lot of chit chat that something was coming. Um, if there was a way that when March hit, when stores were closing, if there was a way to not start working on your next season and your next season was only four months away, you could have saved so much money, time, effort, production, um, waste, <laughs> you know? So getting closer to market and faster to market is honestly it is the key to line planning in a better way excellent hope that makes sense yes it makes sense to me hopefully it makes sense to all our audience who are listening so. for <laughs> every word <laughs> hoping to take something back and rethink we have to rethink and i'm yeah. sure as as we said before we, we actually got recording is that 
I think probably retailers have every intention. They, they set off the season, okay, we've got to solve this problem. We've got to find mm-hmm. a different way. And they set off with this great intention. And then the clock runs forward and they get to that critical point where they have to place an order or so won't get won't get any stock at all. So that, and then all that work that may have been all that good intention of, of solving this problem and reducing the amount of overstocks that we have to deal with through mm-hmm. the different options that you, you spelled out. Um, I, I suspect that there's okay appetite, but when it comes to the crunch point, the appetite's lost and we, we, we do what we've always done. We're, yes. I'm hoping the pandemic has, has shaken that shell and it has made retailers reflect and just go, do you know what? We've been doing this for, say, 100 years, not, not personally, uh, but uh, that we, we, ne- we now need a, a process or a system, call it what you, however they might describe it, a methodology of, of solving this or at least radically reducing it down to something that we can be comfortable about. We can, yeah, yeah. sure, we might want to put some provision for markdown in, but it's like tiny compared to what it used to be. Could we have more confidence? We understand our consumers better. Uh, therefore we can price point it correctly and we understand our consumers better therefore we know what stock they want and Mm -hmm. what volumes of that stock they're prepared to absorb from us yeah exactly and i think that um if we really think about the number of SKUs we're developing uh the number of items we're really setting up every season do we really need all that Mm -hmm. no uh, we need to reduce the number of SKUs we're putting in, in the marketplace. Uh, we need to reduce the depth to, uh, you know, kind of hone in that over-purchasing and over-buying and over-production. Uh, we also need to really understand, do we need that big line plan uh, for the entire year? We don't need a calendar for the whole year. It, approvals, uh, changing the way people are working, getting more digital, that's going to reduce that calendar and get you closer to market. Um getting you closer to market faster so it's really changing the way the way that you've been working but you're right you just have to kind of pause and just almost like just start fresh i think on that bombshell starting fresh (laughs) i think it's a wrap so we've had a i think we've had a really good conversation about trying to get into the nuts and bolts of reducing the transportation the movement from the supplier to to our stores and can often result in uh, quite a big markdown and cost uh, as a result of that. I think we'll pick up the, the pace on our next podcast. So in the meantime, thanks, Lisa. Uh, and thank you to all our audience for, for listening in and continuing to support the conversations that we, we have with each other. My pleasure. Okay. It's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed the conversation. Hit the like button and leave your comments. Connect with us on LinkedIn to get the heads up on future episodes of The Retail Code.